Torah portion for this week is uh, Beshalach, and it's uh, the, translated as from the first few words of the portion, when he let go. It's from when Pharaoh let the children of Israel go. Uh, and it's a great Torah portion. In this Torah portion, we've got some amazing stories. We get the uh, destruction of the whole Egyptian army there at the Red Sea. And then we get the story of uh, God healing the waters there at Mara. And then we get the story of the manna and God providing the quail. It's an amazing, amazing uh, portion. We get the story of uh, the Meribah and Massa issue. And then we get the destruction of the Amalekites, Amalekites. And so it's a, a wonderful Torah portion. And there's one uh, theme that runs through the portion, and that is of trusting God. And so uh, there's an opening scripture here in our Torah portion from Exodus chapter 14. In verse 31, it says, When Israel saw the great work that Adonai did over the Egyptians, the people feared Adonai, and they believed Adonai, and believed in his servant Moshe, Moses. This is uh, uh, the opening there, and it's right after the highlights. They've just seen the Egyptian army destroyed in the Red Sea. Their faith is high, and now they say, we believe, we believe, we fear Adonai, and we trust in his servant Moshe, and it, Kind of made me wonder, you know, why did it take this to get them to trust? I mean, they've seen him do all the miracles there, the plagues, the signs, and the wonders in Egypt. I think by the time of the uh, locust or maybe the boils or the lice or the, the water turning to blood, maybe that would have been a good time to believe in God. But it's not until this time that they really believe God and trust in his servant Moshe. And they're rejoicing in this great victory. And they profess their faith, their trust in Adonai here at the Red Sea. And we get the great s song of Moses, and we get Miriam out there dancing with a tambourine. Kind of sounds like a Shabbat service here at Beth Messiah. Kind of like we had today. Eve, that was a great song set. Wonderful job in picking those out. He's a good, good father. We can trust in him. I couldn't have picked a better set list, and it's uh, wonderful to have Pam pick that for us and uh, have her lead the service. Beautiful. Um, but then we get just a, am I still, there we go, still connecting, just a few verses later, actually three days later, they get to the children of Israel, they just had this great triumph, the horse and the rider thrown into the sea, the Lord is my strength and my song, and he's become my salvation, they're declaring their trust in God, and everything is riding high, three days later, they hit uh, the spring there at Mara, and it's the bitter waters. And they complain against Moses and complain against God. And you think, what has happened here in three days? How did everything fall apart? Where did the wheels come off at? How did they get from rejoicing and declaring their trust in Adonai to questioning him and grumbling and complaining? Well, I would say that the children of Israel probably aren't that different than you or I. You know, when you first came to faith and you were born again and it was awesome, God was doing miracles and your faith, your confidence in him was great. It seemed like every prayer you prayed was breaking through and you're getting great marvelous answers. And then if you're like me, you go through life and all of a sudden the day-to-day -day things hit and you have to begin to trust, is God really with me in the day-to-day -day issues? Is he still there? Is he still with me when the water's bitter, when things don't go so good at your work, when everything seems to be falling apart at your school or situation with your friends or colleagues, and you begin to say, where is God in all this? And I believe it's because the children of Israel hadn't walked that long with the Lord. They hadn't built a history of trust with him yet. And I believe that's what God is building in this Torah portion but, you know, I think the problem is the, this, this problem just isn't centralized to the children of Israel, and it's not just centralized with you and me. I believe the research even shows that uh, it happens to a lot of people in America. And so I've put up some of the research from the Pew Research Institute, and they say, you know, 80%, according to their research, 80% of Americans say they believe in God. That number is actually declining a little bit every year, but that's still a pretty good percentage, about 9 out of 10 80% say they believe in God, but it gets a little more troubling as we break down those statistics a little more. It says that only 56% of those who say they believe in God believe in the God of the Bible. So only about half of the people in America actually believe in the God uh, that's described in the Bible. 
the rest believe in some other higher power or they don't even believe at all. Uh, and so when we break down the numbers a little bit, we find that there's a large people that say they believe in the concept of God or they believe in God. But when we narrow it down a little bit, it's a little smaller who actually believe in the God of the Bible and what he says. And then when the statistics get broken down a little bit further, um, we see that amongst Christians, 80% say they believe uh, in the God that's described in the Bible. And there's about 20% that don't believe in the God of the Bible. I don't know quite how that works, how you can be a Christian and not believe in the God of the Bible. But uh, there it is, the statistics, uh, uh, you know, have a small margin of error, but this is how it was reported. It's even a little more concerning amongst the Jewish population. Only 33% of the Jewish population says that they believe in the God of the Bible. My glasses are a little bit uh, dim. I think it's 56% say that they believe in some other higher power, and about 20% uh, don't believe in God or aren't really sure. Uh, so these are, numbers are concerning for us. It tells us there's this general belief in God, but not necessarily a trust in the God of the Bible. The other numbers about the religious nuns, the people that are unconnected to anything and they just believe anything and everything. So, they, you know, they're not stuck to any book. So they believe whatever. They, they, they come up with their own God, I think those folks do. I'm not quite sure about those guys. They just believe in some higher power out there. The universe told me. Well, bless God, the universe is, majest, is amazing and it's wonderful, but the God that created the universe is even much better than the universe. So uh, I'd rather not be with those religious nuns. It has nothing to do with Catholic nuns. That's people that believe in nothing, nuns, there we go. Uh, moving right along, so we see as we break this down, in the U.S. about half the adults believe that God determines what happens to them most or all the time. We see that, the percentages there at the bottom, 27% believe that God controls the things that happen to them all the time, 21% most of the time, some of the time, hardly ever, never, and then 10, they don't think they believe in anything. But it's a concerning because about 48% say they believe that God has something to do, but only 27% really believe that God's in control all the time. So now we went from 80% all the way down to only 27% of the people that actually believe that God, they have trust that God is controlling what's going on in their lives. And so I would I'd say that the Americans aren't really that much different than the children of Israel. This is of those who believe God or a higher power. 77% believe that God's protected them. 76%, uh, 67% believe that God has rewarded them or the higher power has rewarded them. 61% believe that God or the higher power will judge all people on what they've done. And then 40% believe that he's punished them. Apparently punishment's not very popular. Reward is 77%, punishment's only 40%. We kind of like that idea of God being the Santa Claus in the sky that just gives out goodies and gifts and he's all loving, all kind. God forbid he would say punish or anything like that. Only 40% believe in that kind of God. So when we see when you break down the numbers, there's this great trust in God, the big God. But when it really comes down to his operation in our lives, there's not that much confidence or trust in who he is or his direction in our lives. I'm checking to see once if notes have come back. It looks like not, so here we go. Let's keep flying. We doing okay so far? Amen. All right, so let's keep moving. This issue of trust, I would say, is a major issue uh, because trust is one of the ways that God develops a relationship with us is through testing our trust. And we see this uh, in the scriptures. It says in James chapter 1 and verse 2 through 4, Consider all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect works, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So the scripture from James tells us that we should consider it all joy when we go through trials because we know that the testing of our faith produces endurance and endurance uh, to have its perfect works that we may be perfect and everything lacking nothing. I don't think that it will be perfect and will not sin, it's that our faith can be perfected, our trust can be perfected. And the way that God perfects our trust a lot of time is through trials. He's got different ways to perfect our trust, but trials is one of the main ways that he perfects our trust. And we see this from the scripture. So therefore, I've named this message the trust 
test, the trust test, because it's a test that God gives to each of us to build our trust. As we go through life, there's different things that we'll encounter, and as we go through those things, God wants it to build our trust in him. It says, uh, according to Job chapter 7 and 17 through 18, it says, What is mankind that you magnify him, that you set your heart on him, that you visit him every morning and test him every moment? According to Job, each day we're going through a test. Each day God tests us. Each day is an opportunity to either pass the test or fail the test. But unfortunately, most of us flunk the test because we don't even realize we're taking a test. And we don't even realize God has given us the test. So we, we're off the, we're, we have already failed before we even started. We mess up and blow it because we fail to see God's hand in it. Now, I'm not saying everything that happens in our life necessarily, uh, God is the author of it. That, that all the bad things that happen to us uh, come to us, God is the author. But I would say that God tests our trust through difficulties. There are several ways he tests our trust, but... One of the main ways is through difficulties. I'm going to introduce two of them today, and they both start with D, so it's pretty easy to remember. One way God trusts our trust is through difficulties. Now, again, I'm not saying that everything that comes through to your life, that God is the author of it. You know, uh, because we live in a sinful, fallen world, some things just happen to us just because of the sinful, fallen world that we fall in. The scriptures tell us that the Rain falls on the just and the unjust. You know, some things just happen. That's the product of the fall. We live in a sinful, fallen world. And when Yeshua's disciples went to him and asked him about the man that had a, uh, a health issue, they said, who sinned, this man or his father's his parents? And Yeshua said, neither, but this was done for the glory of God. So the issue when we go through a problem isn't to say, why is this happening to me? You know, who's doing this? Is it God? Is it the devil? Is it my co-worker? Is it my wife? That's not the issue. We're not to look at who sent it. The big issue is, how am I going to respond to it? That's the big issue. Are we going to trust God even in the difficult times? It's easy to trust him when everything's going well. When the horse and the rider have been thrown into the sea, hallelujah, shout unto God. It's easy to rejoice in that situation. But how about when difficult times come? How about when the water doesn't taste good, when the water is bitter, when that situation you're going through at work is a bitter situation, when that situation, your relationship with that loved one seems to be in a difficult position and it tastes bitter, when that situation at your work or at your school, when you're struggling in a difficult time, that's the time we have to ask, can we trust God? And that was the same question that was put to the children of Israel, can they trust God in this? We see in 1 Peter chapter 1 through 7, it says, These trials are so that the true metal of your faith, far more valuable than gold, which perishes though refined by fire, may come to light and praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Messiah Yeshua. So what's going on here in 1 Peter? He says there's trials that come that uh, test the true metal of our faith. I would say our faith isn't really proven, our trust isn't really proven until it goes through a difficult time, a trial. And though it's, uh, it's, it's refined, it's far more valuable than gold. Gold and silver have to be put into the fire to let the heat come upon it so that all the dross comes to the surface. Those who work the goldsmith or the silversmith that work with metals, they heat it to a point to where it breaks down. And then when it breaks down, it releases all those impurities that are in the metal and they can take and skim that off. And it's been said that a silversmith can tell the quality of the silver when he can see his image reflected in the silver. I believe it's the same way in our lives. God is looking to see if his image can be reflected in our lives. That when people see us go through a difficult time, that they see his image in us. They don't see all the junk that comes to the surface. That's easy to do. Anyone can see the dross. It's easy to have dross come to the surface. When the heat is on, when everything's coming against you at work and your boss has put in impossible uh, expectations on you, or you're in that situation at school and you've got an overload with all your classes, or maybe a situation in your family and the heat is on, what comes to the surface? It's easy for all the dross to come to the surface. It's, that's most of the time we put that out. 
But God wants to scrape that off. He wants to get rid of that stuff so that we might reflect his image. That when we go through a difficult time, we're not like the heathens, the pagans of the world that have no hope in their lives. That when we get hot, when the heat's on, when the pressure's on, that Yeshua comes out. That we shine like his image. That we reflect his glory to the world. Anyone can get the dross out. We've all got plenty of dross. And it, it's not hard to see the dross. Uh, you know, just a little poke here and there, and we, that dross comes out quick. Put a little heat on, get a little hot under the collar, and boy, the dross really comes out. God's wanting us to get to the place where we don't respond at, at, in dross, and we get angry at the heat, or get angry at our coworker, or get angry at, at that family member. That's not the source of your problem. God's trying to get rid of the dross. Our question in those situations is not why did it come to me or oh me or oh why or that person's against me or this person's against me. If I could just get rid of them. The question we have to ask is, God, what do you want me to do in this situation? What part of my character are you wanting to refine through this difficult time? What part of my trust are you testing here? That's the big question when you go through difficult times is what's God wanting to do? Too often we focus on is this from God, is this from the devil, and we get busy trying to argue and complain against this one or that one, instead of saying, God, what are you trying to teach me through this? Again, I'm not saying he sent it to you, but things in our life happen. Some of the problems we create ourselves, Some, most of the problems I'd say we create. We got ourselves into the mess, and we're just reaping what we sowed. We made some poor decisions and we got ourselves in the frying pan, out of the frying pan and into the fire, and we're just living in the product of, of our own bad decisions. And we've created the problem. We've created the gift difficult time. Sometimes, though, it does happen that other people create difficulties. There is circumstances where other people have wronged you. They have offended you. They have uh, wronged you or uh, harmed you. And those things do happen. But the question even there isn't about them. The question is, God, what do you want me to do? to do through this? How do you want to refine my character through this? How do you want Messiah to shine through this situation? Get your eyes off from where it came from. Get your eyes onto what does God want me to do in this? What is he testing here? What is he trying to, what, what, uh, what is he trying to build in my life? We get a picture of this in Exodus chapter 15, uh, 22 through 27 and it says then Moses led Israel onward from the sea of reeds they went out into the wilderness of Shur but they traveled three days in the wilderness and found no water when they came to Marah they could not drink the waters because they were bitter on account of this it was called Marah so the people complained to Moses saying what are we going to drink so he cried out to Adonai and Adonai showed him a tree and when he threw it into the waters they were made sweet there he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. He said, if you diligently listen to the voice of Adonai your God and do what is right in his eyes, pay attention to his mitzvot and keep his decrees, I'll put none of the diseases on which I have put on the Egyptians on you, for I am Adonai who heals you. Then they came to Elam, and there there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, so they camped there by the waters. Now the question would be, there's Elam, why didn't God just bring them to Elam? There's beautiful 12 springs there, plenty of water. There's lots of nice shade. There are date palms. There's probably some food there. Why didn't God just bring them to Elam? Wouldn't that have been the best way in our book? Probably we say, man, bring us to Elam. That's the Hilton. You know, that is golden and an oasis there in the desert. Why didn't God just bring them there? Why do he have to bring them to Mara where the waters are bitter? Well, there's a purpose in it. God's trying to show them as he healed the water so he could heal them. But you know, if we get our eyes off and focus on the circumstances, we get all bitter and angry at God and say, why did you bring me to this bitter spring? Why did you give me that boss? God forbid, why did you give me that spouse? <laughs> why did you give me that family member? Ugh, they just are bitter. And, and we get bitter. But if we'll let God do what he wants to do through the circumstance and we'll get rid of the bitterness and say, God, what are you wanting me to learn through this circumstance? What are you trying to refine in my life? We'll see that he can teach us a lesson even through bitter water. He's got Elam for us. Elam is just up the road. Elam is where they ended up at. They camped by the waters and they had this beautiful, spacious 12 springs, plenty of water to drink, plenty of shade. God's got Elam for us, but he's first got to teach us. He's first got to teach us to trust him. That's why he gives us the trust test 
so that we can trust him. There's things that he's wanting to show us. No matter what the circumstance is, we can find God in that circumstance. We can find Yeshua, that he is there with us. He's our ever-present help in time of need. He will be there and meet us if we'll have a humble heart and say, Lord, what do you want to do in me? What part of my trust are you perfecting in this? How are you wanting to refine me? Instead of getting our eyes on the circumstances or getting our eyes on other people, we say, Lord, what are you wanting to do with me? <clears throat> There's another lesson, that a way that God uh, tests us. And I say that he tests our trust through his demands. Remember the first D was difficult times. The second way he tests our trust is through difficult demands. What are demands? Demands are things that he puts in his scriptures that sometimes are challenging for us. According to Jewish reckoning that came from uh, Maimonides, according to his tradition, there's 613 commands in the Torah. But I've got interesting news for you. There's actually 1,050 commands in the Brit Hadashah. Wow! You talk about ratcheting things up. People want to be Torah observant. Let's start out with being Brit Hadashah observant. Love your neighbor as yourself. Be holy as I am holy. Turn your other cheek. Care for those who persecute you. There's 1,050 just in the Breed Out of Shah. And even if we categorize them and we put them together under headings, there's still 800. Wow, that's a lot to do. I say people that want to be Torah observant, start with the second half of the book. There's a lot of things there that deal with, the other, with our heart. A lot of things that have to do with how we treat one another. Love one another as I have loved you. Forgive one another as I have forgiven you. Man, 1,050 commandments in the Breed Out of Shah. And God tests our trust through his demands. The thing is, sometimes we find a demand that uh, sounds unreasonable or unrealistic. And we tend to doubt God on it. Look at Exodus 16 and verse 4. It says, Then Adonai said to Moses, Behold, I will rain down bread from heaven from you. The people go out and gather it a day's portion every day so that I can test them to find out whether or not they'll walk according to my Torah or not. This is where God gives the children of Israel manna from heaven, and he tells them, you know, go out each day and just gather a day's portion for yourself. Those of us who like to multitask, we would say, well, Lord, how come we can't just, you know, maybe collect enough for the week? I'm going out anyways. Let me get my shopping done for the whole week. You know, it's better on time and resources. It saves gas. That's a lot better way to go. You know what? We can kill two birds with one stone. Let me just get enough for the rest of the week. You know, maybe I'll be sick tomorrow. It's better that I get some today. Who knows what happens? I could trip over a rock and get bit by a snake. I better get enough for today and tomorrow and maybe the next few days. You know what? Let me stock up for the whole month. I won't have to go to the supermarket again for the whole month. But God says, no, just get enough for one day. What's the issue of one day? God wants us to know that each day he's going to be there for us. He provides our needs day after day. Yeshua said, don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough worries of, of their own. Today has enough worries of its own. Worry about today. God's wanting to show us that his provision is there for us each day. And so it's a lesson that they're supposed to learn according to uh, his word. He's testing them to find out whether they'll trust him or not. That they'll trust that tomorrow there'll be provision there. That there'll be enough tomorrow, that they don't have to hoard it all up, worrying about lack for tomorrow. Do you realize that is what hoarding is? It's a lack of trust that God will provide for tomorrow. Ooh, i got to clean my garage out. <laughs> he wants us to trust him day by day, daily bread for us. And that's the lesson he's giving them there. He's giving them the trust test. Will you trust me in this? Will you trust that I will actually provide your needs each day? Unfortunately, see from Scripture, they didn't do too well at this. They didn't trust him in it. They failed miserably the trust test, and some of them went out and gathered enough for two days, and what happened? It got all rotty and spoiled. It got maggots in it. Ooh, some nasty stuff. That's worse than the stuff in the back of the refrigerator. That, ooh. <laughs> but the most amazing thing is on Shabbat, they could go get two portions, a double portion on Friday. What amazing, amazing thing. 
that God made it so on Friday you could get two portions and it would carry over so that you didn't have to work on Shabbat. You know, he's got a way of making provision for you that you can get enough in six days that you don't have to work that seventh day. That's awesome. But it's a way of testing our hearts. I've had people tell me, well, brother, I just can't afford not to work on Shabbat. Well, I'll leave that between you and the Lord, but God says that he is giving us enough, that there's a, enough portion that he can multiply our provision, that there's enough on, of his provision to carry you through the Shabbat. But they test him in this too, and some of them go out on Shabbat, even after they've been told, they fail the test miserably. They fail the trust test miserably because they still go out on Shabbat and there's no manna there. But how many of us have been like that? We hear God's commandment and we find some way to get around it. We find some way to say, well, that doesn't really apply to me. Or, you know, that was 2,000 years ago. Or, you know, that just doesn't work here in America. That only worked over there in Israel. Or, you know, God doesn't still do that. This is the 2000s. We, we have internet now and credit cards. And One area that God really tests us in this is in our finance. He says, you know, if you'll put me first in your finance, if, you, if you'll do the 10%, see once if I won't bless you in the 90. We're not that different than the children of Israel. How many times do we doubt God and find ways around it and say, well, no, that doesn't really apply to me or that... You know, that, that, that was for then, or this is for that. And we find ways to get around, and we fail the trust test. God is asking us to trust him in his demands. Some of them are put there just to see if we'll actually obey it, if we'll actually follow it, and trust him that he has it. Finance is one of the biggest areas he tests on this. Will we trust him in our finances? Will we trust that he can really multiply the 90 and take care of our needs? not saying that God will bless our mess. We do need to take care of getting rid of debt and getting rid of stuff that would pull away from us, that would uh, devour our income. But God will meet us at this. He will bless us in it if we'll trust him in it. That's what he's asking is for us to trust him, to trust his hand. We read there in Exodus 17, verse 37, it says, that the people thirst for water there and they complained against Moses and said, why have you brought us out of Egypt to kill us with thirst? along with our children and cattle. So Moses cried out to Adonai saying, what am I to do for these people? They're about ready to stone me. Wow. Remember these people who at the beginning of the Torah portion, they're saying, we trust God. We believe God. We believe his servant Moshe. Now they're ready to stone Moshe. They're ready to fire this guy. Give us some water or we stone you. Boy, what happened to the trust, the confidence? Well, you talk about having your job on the line. Man, Moses. Who would want to be the CEO of that company? Wow, these guys are tough. Give us water, we stone you. They're ready to get rid of him. But they do something interesting here. The children of Israel, they do something very, very interesting. They turn it around. They've already flunked God's trust test. And now they turn it around, they test God. Listen to what it says. All right, I said to Moses, walk before the people and take the elders of Israel with you, along with your staff, which you struck the water, and take it in your hand and go. Behold, I will stand before you there upon the rock at Horeb. Wow, interesting side note. Who, who, who was that standing on the rock? Hallelujah. Scriptures tells us that rock that followed him was Yeshua. Hallelujah. Why didn't they all see him? I don't think they had trust to see him. But anyways, moving along to another sermon for another time. There he is, Yeshua, providing water from the rock. You were to strike the rock, incident, oh, I can't help it. Can I take a rabbit trail? Remember one time he's told to strike the rock once? Another time he's told to speak to the rock? Just a theory, but Yeshua is only struck once. He died once. If the rock is a picture of Yeshua, the next time we speak to him, we don't strike him. Yeshua struck him twice. It's a little rabbi theory, but it's a picture of Yeshua who was struck, who died for the sins of the world. Moshe hit the rock twice. He didn't honor God before the children of Israel. And God dealt with them because it was a picture of Yeshua. Yeshua was struck once. He wasn't to be struck twice. He died once for the sins of all. Okay, only a rabbi theory, but moving right along. Who's on this rock at Horeb? Yeshua, possibly. He's standing before them. He says, you strike the rock and the water will come out from it so that the people can drink. Then Moses did just uh, so in the eyes of the elders of the people. And the name of that place is called Massa and Meribah because the quarrying of B'nai Israel and because they tested Adonai, saying, is Adonai with us or not? You see what they've done? They failed the test so miserably, now they switch gears, and now they test God. 
That's a common thing to do. If we can test the tester, we can get out of the test. I don't know if you've got the validity to test me. I, you know, are you really God? Are you really among us or not? They flipped the thing around. Now they're testing God, and God's not happy with them about it. Because what they're doing is getting themselves out from under God's authority. They're getting themselves out from under that trust test. They've already failed it miserably. And so they just change the script around. Now they're testing God and say, is he really among us or not? If he doesn't give us water, well, then maybe he's not God. And therefore, we don't even have to obey him. Let's get rid of Moshe. Let's get a new leader. Let's, we can do our own thing. If you get rid of the test giver, you can get out of the test. And that's what they do. They turn the script. They test God. And God's not very happy with them. Look at what it's recorded in Psalm 95, verse 6 through 11 about this. It says, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before Adonai, our maker. The psalmist has given us this picture. We can trust in Adonai. He is our maker. Let's worship him. He's created us. And it goes on, it says, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his flock of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, what's the psalmist saying? We can trust God. He's like a shepherd. He's taking care of us. He's going to lead us beside the still waters. He's going to restore our souls unto us. He's going to lead us into green pastures. We can trust his leading in our life. We can trust him. The psalmist is asking us to look at him as a good shepherd that really cares about us, that cares about our lives. I would say the good shepherd still cares for all of us. He's got a great destiny. He's got a great plan for our lives. He's got a promised land for each of us. He's just asking us to trust him, to trust him in the day-to-day -day things, to trust him when the times are difficult, to trust him when his demands seem unreasonable. He's wanting to show us himself strong on our behalf, but he's wanting us to pass the trust test, to put our confidence in him. The verse goes on. It says, do not harden your heart as at Meribah or in the days of Massa in the wilderness. God is wanting us to have a soft heart before him, a heart that will trust him, that will trust that when times are difficult that he's holding us in the palm of his hand. To trust that when we can't see how things are going to work out, that he's got us. To have a soft heart, a tender heart. Not to have a heart of bitterness, a heart of resentment or anger. A heart that's against those around us thinking that they're the cause of our problems. He's wanting us to have a soft heart, a tender heart, trusting him and not to harden our heart. When your fathers tested me, they challenged me even though they had seen his work. Can you imagine the chutzpah of the children of Israel to say, is God really among us? He's already wiped out the, the uh, he's already brought the, the, the plagues. He's already wiped out the Egyptian army. He's uh, given them manna. He's given them quail. He's, he's changed the water, the bitter water to sweet water. He's brought them to Elam with the 70 springs. God's done all this for them, and yet they have the question, the, the chutzpah, the question, is God really among us? They turn the script, and they begin testing and challenging God. And God, God's not happy with it. He's not pleased with it. Because they're getting themselves out from under the trust test, and now they're trusting God. They're testing God. They've changed the script. God is asking us to be like those who will trust Him and not test Him. That when trusts and trials come in our lives, that we'll have confidence that He is leading us into green pastures, that He is a good shepherd. You know, one of the people that I believe has passed the trust test very well is Pam Carney. I've seen her walk through a very, very difficult time, but I've seen her writings. I've read everything she's posted, and I've seen a woman that has walked through extremely difficult times, but her confidence in her God has been strong all the way through. She's given great glory to her God. Even when she didn't know what it was all about, she knew who her God was and what he was all about. Pam, thank you for being a living witness and passing the trust test and giving us all confidence in our great God and our great King. Amen. And it goes on, for 40 years I loathed that generation. I said, this is a people whose heart goes astray who do not know my ways. God is wanting us to learn his ways. But we're not going to learn our ways when everything's his ways, when everything's comfortable. When we're at Elam and the, set, the springs are there and the the uh, palm trees are there and everything's light and easy and everything's good. We learn his ways in difficult times, in times of testing, in demands that seem unreasonable. That's when we learn his ways. That's when he shows himself mighty on our behalf. That's when he becomes our ever-present help in time of need. If you're going through a difficult time today or if you're struggling his demands, I encourage you to grab hold of God, to trust his work in your life. To trust that he has good plans for you. To trust 
that even though you might not see the purpose behind it, you can trust him. It's been said that uh, disappointments are God's appointments, that God meets us at those places, that God meets us in our difficult times, that God meets us when his demands seem unrealistic. That's when he has an opportunity to show himself strong on our behalf. That's when he builds trust. Trust is not built in the easy times. Trust is built in the difficult times. When it seems like everything's falling apart, but we hold on to him. We have a history. We have a record of his hand. We can trust him and know his ways. Then he goes on and says, therefore I swear in my anger, they shall never into my rest. God is wanting to bring us into a place of rest. He's wanting to bring us into a place of trust. He wants all of us to be like little children who say, Abba, I don't understand it all, but I do trust you. It doesn't always make sense to me, but I know that you hold the future. I've got confidence that you are leading and guiding me, that you are bringing me into green pastures, that you are leading me beside still waters, that I can trust in you. As we get ready to close here, I'd encourage you to ask God to help you pass the trust test. That when the difficult times come or when the demands seem unreasonable, that he will help you and give you the confidence to trust him. That our battle is not against flesh and blood, but our confidence is in our great God and our great king. We sang it today in the worship set there, he's a good, good father. He wants good things for us. He loves us even more than we can even imagine. He has got good plans for us. He's wanting to bring us into a promised land. He's wanting to bring us into a destiny and a purpose. But we have to trust his hand along the way. And sometimes we need to say, God, what are you wanting me to learn through this trust, through this trust test? What is it in my character that you're wanting to refine? What are you wanting to get out? As I saw Eve reflect his image so clearly through what she wrote, I would like all of us to be like that, that silver that's refined and reflects the image of the silversmith. May we reflect the image of Messiah Yeshua through our lives, that we don't flunk and fail the test, and that we don't turn the script and try to tr test God instead, that we have humble hearts and we say, Lord, I, 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 I trust in you. I don't understand it all, but I trust in you. I've got confidence in you. Could we close in prayer? Father, I thank you for your word for us today. I thank you that as you provided for the children of Israel, Lord, that you brought them out of the land of captivity and bondage, and you brought them into the promised land. Lord, that you've got promised land for each of us. You've got a purpose, a destiny for each of us. Lord, as we go on that journey from uh, slavery and Egypt and bondage to sin to the promised land that you have for us, give us the strength to pass the trust test, that we can trust in you, that our confidence is in you, and may we reflect your image. When we go through difficult times, when we have difficult demands, may we shine brightly, may we reflect the image of Messiah Yeshua. I ask this in the name of Yeshua Messiah. Amen and amen.